Okay, so this video is about Rule 3, Parties to Civil Action. Uh, rule 3 is a bar examination favorite, so please study it carefully. There are 22 provisions, and so far, there has been no amendment to this rule. So let's start with Section 1. Section 1 is about who may be parties, the plaintiff and defendant. So only natural persons or juridical persons or entities authorized by law may be parties in a civil action. So what are the examples of entities authorized by law? These are the state, the labor organization, the partnerships by Stoppel, the corporations by Stoppel, and foreign corporations. And the term plaintiff may refer to the claiming party, the counterclaimant, the cross-claimant, or the third, fourth, etc. party plaintiff. The term defendant may refer to the original defending party, the defendant in a counterclaim, the cross-defendant, or the third, fourth, etc. party defendant. Okay, so let's go to section 2. Section 2 is parties in interest. We know that in civil action, there are four kinds of parties, and that is the real party in interest, the representative party, the indispensable party, and the necessary party. So section 2 talks about the real party in interest and its definition. A real party in interest is the party who stands to be benefited or enjoyed by the judgment in the suit or the party entitled to the avails of the suit. Unless otherwise authorized by law or these rules, every action must be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest. Okay, so let's go now to section 3, representative as parties. As already mentioned, we said that there are four kinds of parties, and that is real party in interest, which we discuss in section 2. And the second kind of parties is the representative parties, and uh, section 3 talks about them. And here's the provision. The provision says that where the action is allowed to be prosecuted and defended by a representative or someone acting in a fiduciary capacity, you have to include always the beneficiary because he is deemed to be the real party in interest. So the beneficiary shall be included in the title of the case and shall be deemed to be the real party in interest. A representative may be a trustee of an expert trust, a guardian, an executor or administrator, or a party authorized by law or these rules. If there is an agent acting in his own name and for the benefit of an undisclosed principal, he can be he can sue or he can be sued without joining the principal, except when the contract involves things belonging to the principal. Section 4 is spouses as parties, husband and wife shall sue or be sued jointly, except as provided by law. Section 5, the minor or incompetent persons. A minor or a person alleged to be incompetent, he can sue also or can be sued as long as it is with assistance of his father, his mother, his guardian, or if he, have, if he has none, his guardian ad litem. Okay, so let's talk now with about Section 6, the permissive jointer of parties. Permissive jointer of parties is a bar exam favorite. It is related to Section 2, uh, sec uh, Rule 2, Section 5, which, which is about the jointer of causes of actions. So this is related. Um, this is your exception to the jointer of causes of actions. And what does it say? All persons in whom or against whom any right to relief in respect to or arising out of the same transaction or series of transactions is alleged to exist, whether jointly, severally, or in the alternative, may, except as otherwise provided in these rules, they can be joined as plaintiffs or be joined as defendants in one complaint, subject to these conditions that Number one, where any question of law or fact common to all such plaintiffs or to all such defendants may arise in the action. 
but the court may make such orders as may be just to prevent any plaintiff or defendant from being embarrassed or put to expense in connection with any proceedings in which he may have no interest. So this is a long provision, but if you will be asked later on in your exams, uh, either finals or midterms or in the bar examination questions, if ever you will be asked to explain or define the concept of permissive jointer of parties, just say that there is the right to relief arises out of the same transaction or series of transactions and there is a question of law or fact common to all such plaintiffs or to all such defendants. Okay, so section 7 and section 8 are bar examination favorite. These are the definitions of indispensable parties and necessary parties. Again, like we said, there are four classifications of parties in civil action, and that is the real party and in interest, which was uh, discussed in section 2 and uh, representative party which was discussed in section 3 and now section 7 is about indispensable party and section 8 is about necessary party so indispensable party section 7 is parties in interest without whom no final determination can be had of an action shall be joined either as plaintiffs or defendants and necessary party is one who is not indispensable, but who ought to be joined as a party if complete relief is to be accorded as to those already parties or for a complete determination or settlement of the claim subject of the action. So that's section 8, necessary party. So just to distinguish the two, just remember indispensable party Remember the keyword, no final determination can be had. Whereas necessary party, just need to remember complete determination of or settlement of the claim subject of the action. Okay, so let's go to section 9, nine non-joinder of necessary parties to be pleaded. This is a bar exam area. Uh, this is a bar exam favorite already asked in the bar examinations countless times. So, whenever in any pleading in which a claim is asserted, a necessary is not joined, the pleader shall set forth his name if known and shall state why he is omitted. Should the court find the reason for the omission unmeritorious, it may order the inclusion of the omitted necessary party only if jurisdiction over his person may be obtained. The failure to comply with the order for his inclusion without justifiable cause shall be deemed a, a waiver of the claim against such party. If ever there is a non-inclusion of a necessary party, what is the effect? It will not prevent the court from proceeding in the action and the judgment re rendered therein shall be without prejudice to the rights of such necessary party. So please study carefully section 9. Section 10 is about unwilling co-plaintiff. So if the consent of any party who should be joined and this plaintiff cannot be obtained, he be made a defendant and the, re the reason therefore shall be stated in the complaint. Section 11 is misjoinder and non-joinder parties. Section 11 is the same or almost the same with Section 6 of Rule 2, which is the misjoinder of causes of action. So what are the effects if ever there are, uh, there are cases of misjoinder or non-joinder parties? It is not a ground for dismissal of an action. Parties may be dropped or added by the order of the court on motion of any party or on the court's initiative or on its own initiative at any stage in the action and on such terms as are just. Any claim against a misjoined party may be severed and proceeded with separately. Section 12 is about class suit. This is an important provision and bar exam area. A bar exam favorite when the subject matter of the controversy is one of common or general interest to many persons so numerous that it is impracticable to join all as parties a number of them which the court finds to be sufficiently numerous and representative 
as to fully protect the interest of all concerned may sue or defend for the benefit of all so here you can already see the requirements of class suit uh, it must be of common or general interest to many persons and that many persons are so numerous and those bringing the case to the court are sufficiently numerous or they are uh, sufficiently represented to fully protect the interest of others any party in interest shall have the right to intervene to protect his individual interest section 13 is alternative defendants so if you are going if you will be asked what is the concept of alternative defendants just say the plaintiff is uncertain against who of several persons he is entitled to relief that's why he can join any or all of them as defendants in the alternative although a right to relief against one may be inconsistent with a right of relief against the other i saw this in a bar examination question but this has only been asked only once section 14 is the unknown identity or name of defendant whenever the identity or the name of defendant is unknown he may be sued as the unknown heir the unknown owner the unknown devisee or by such other designation as the case may require when his identity identity or true name is discovered the pleading must be amended accordingly section 15 is entity without juridical personality as defendant so if you are suing um a person pretending to, pretending to be a corporation but has no sec registration so if two or more persons not organized as an entity with juridical personality enter into a transaction they can still be sued under the name by which they are generally or commonly known and what are they going to do in the answer of such defendant the names as well as the addresses of the persons composing said entity must all be revealed okay so let's go to section 16 the death of the part of a party and the duty of the council section section 16 is a bar exam favorite a bar exam area please study please take note and if you can memorize memorize so if ever there is a party to a pending action uh, who's dead or who dies and the claim is not thereby extinguished what is the duty of his counsel his counsel is obliged to inform the court within 30 days after such death of the fact thereof aside from his duty to inform the court he is also he also has that duty to give the name and address of his legal representative or representatives what will happen to the counsel who fails to comply with this directive the failure of counsel to comply with his duty shall be a ground for disciplinary action the heirs of the deceased they may be allowed to be substituted so this is a substitution of party the heirs of the deceased may be allowed to be substituted for the deceased without requiring the appointment of an executor or administrator and the court may appoint a guardian ad litem for the minor heirs take note of this this is a an important provision the court shall forthwith order said legal representative or representatives to appear and be substituted within a period of 30 days from notice take note that the court will issue an order so that is a very important provision there has to be an order issued by the court for said legal representative to appear and if no legal representative is named by the counsel for the deceased party or if the one so named shall fail to appear within the specified period what will the court do the court has that option to order the opposing party within a specified time to procure the appointment of an executor or administrator for the estate for the estate of the deceased and the latter shall immediately appear for and on behalf of the deceased the court charges in procuring such appointment 
if the frayed if the frayed by the opposing party may be recovered as costs. Section 17 is about the death or separation of a party who is a public officer. So there are three scenarios here. A, part, a public officer who was previously a party and an action, he either dies, resigns, or otherwise ceases to hold office. So what will happen? The action may be continued and maintained by his successor or against his successor if Within 30 days after the successor takes office or such time as may, be, as may be granted by the court, it is satisfactorily shown to the court by any party that there is a substantial need for continuing or maintaining it and the successor adopts or continues or threatens to adopt or continue to adopt or continue the action of his predecessor. Before a substitution is made, so this is another kind of substitution, para lang hindi kayo malito, there are uh, lots of substitution, the substitution of parties. The section 16 is another kind of substitution. So here is also another kind of substitution. Before a substitution is made, the party or officer to be affected unless expressly assenting thereto shall be given reasonable notice of the application, therefore, and accorded an opportunity to be heard. Section 18 is about the incompetency or the incapacity of a party. If a party becomes incompetent, incompetent or incapacitated, the court, upon motion with notice, may allow the action to be continued by or against the incompetent or incapacitated person assisted by his legal guardian or guardian ad litem. Section 19 is about transfer of interest. In case of any transfer of interest, the action may be continued by or it may be continued against the original party. Unless the court, upon motion, directs the person to whom the interest is transferred to be substituted in the action or joined with the original party. Section 20 is a bar exam favorite, bar exam area. Please study, please take note of this and again, if you can memorize, please do so, but just understand the concept action and contractual money claims where the action is for recovery of money arising from contract express or implied and the defendant dies before entry of final judgment in the court in which the action was pending at the time of such death it shall not be dismissed but shall instead be allowed to continue until entry of final judgment so what are the requirements here there is a recovery of money that arises from an express contract or an implied contract and the defendant dies before the entry of final judgment. So those are the two important requirements. A, a favorable judgment obtained by the plaintiff therein shall be enforced in the manner specially provided in these rules for prosecuting claims against the estate of a deceased person. Section 20 is actually uh, always compared to Section 16 of Rule 3, so just take note of these two provisions. Section 21 is about indigent party. Uh, this is a long provision, but this is a bar exam area, bar exam favorite. Uh, this has been asked in the bar exam, not only once, but a lot of, a uh, couple of times already. So, a party may be authorized to litigate his action, claim, or defense as an indigent or indigent if the court, upon an ex party application and hearing, is satisfied that the party is one who has no money or property sufficient and available for food, shelter, and basic necessities for himself and his family. Such authority shall include exemption from payment of docket and other lawful fees, as well as exemption from the payment of transcripts of stenographic notes which the court may order to be furnished him. 
the amount of the docket and other lawful fees which the indigent was exempted from paying shall be considered a lien on any judgment rendered in the case favorable to the indigent unless the court otherwise provides. Any adverse party may contest the grant of such authority at any time before judgment is rendered by the trial court. If the court should determine after hearing that the party is nagsisunungaling, is declared as an indigent, is in fact a person with sufficient income or property, with sufficient income or property, the proper docket and other lawful fees shall be assessed and collected by the clerk of court. If payment is not made within the time fixed by the court, execution shall issue or the payment thereof without prejudice to other sanctions as the court may impose. So we are down to our last provision, that is Section 22, Notice to the Solicitor General. So do you really have to notify the, the Office of the Solgen of all cases filed against the estate? The answer is no. Only actions involving the validity of any treaty, law, ordinance, executive order, presidential decree, rules or regulations, the court in its discretion may require the appearance of the solgen who may be heard in person or a representative duly designated by him. So, this is your Rule 3 of the Rules of Court.